Greetings, welcome everybody to our this online discussion entitled Migration Patterns After the Pandemic, Comparing Japan's and Europe's Challenges. I am Mate Salai, a Senior Research Fellow at the Institute. I will be the moderator of this um, event. Um, as we can observe, the global flow of both regular and irregular migrants was disrupted as due to the pandemic, many countries around the world have chosen to close their borders, some of them even until next year. This process has highlighted many important aspects of security, mostly economic security, including an unprecedented shortage of low-skilled guest workers in Western Europe, questions related to the open border policy of Japan regarding guest workers, and the sustainability of the EU's single market and its four freedoms. On the other hand, illegal migration was at least temporarily halted due to border closures, but it is expected that due to the economic crisis, which will assuredly uh, be observable after the pandemic, a new wave of illegal migrants will be headed to Europe to seek better lives for themselves. Starting from this point, we would like to tackle three big questions during our discussion today. First, the Hungarian and European position of migration and the state of free movement within the EU after COVID-19. Secondly, Japan's immigration and border policies in the post-COVID-19 era, naturally in a comparative perspective, and the changing patterns of irregular migration after the pandemic. To discuss these questions, we have two excellent colleagues who will share their ideas. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Miyai Takeshi, who is a research fellow at the Japan Institute of International Affairs in Tokyo, and Dr. Viktor Marshai, uh, who is a research director at the Migration Research Institute Budapest and also a senior lecturer at the University of Public uh, Service. So, uh, now, without any further ado, I would like to floor, give, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Miai to share his ideas regarding the topic. Yes, thank you. So, hi everyone, and I can I can see only three people here, but uh, I, I think there are lots of yeah audience there. Uh, thank you. So, my name is Takeshi. I'm a researcher at the Japan Institute of International Affairs, and uh, last September I stayed at IFAD for a month as a Think Visegrad Fellow, and uh, I'm really happy to uh, see this office again. And, uh, but it's also very really pity that I can't meet you in person. So as uh, COVID-19 has forbidden me uh, to land in Hungary again, so in this webinar, I'm gonna talk about the situation in Japan and how the migration pattern has changed under the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, first of all, and in this presentation, I would limit myself to mainly about Japanese situation, as I think it's not so easy to compare EU to Japan, as the uh, immigration power and uh, controlling power of Japanese government is much higher than the EU member states, and, uh, and there are fewer uh, restrictions from the international perspective. So uh, I first explain the Japanese situation, and uh, I'd love to join the discussion about the Japan-EU comparison later. Well, so the Japanese government has banned uh, almost uh, all foreign travel and the issuance of new visas since March. Uh, there has been almost virtually no immigration since the pand pandemic. And the uh, Japanese government is now expected to liberalize travel uh, on, on a country by country and a category by country by category basis in the future. But uh, there is no real prospect for that. And uh, so far, the uh, Japanese pandemic situation itself is not so harsh than the main Western European countries. And uh, thankfully, the EU included Japan as a safe third country uh, for the traveling. But, uh, no, no, but uh, at the same time, uh, in, com in relation to the EU, Japanese government hasn't eased its border to European countries because the situation is somewhat asymmetrical. So we are still living in a very close society uh, without a movement now. So, uh, so let me talk first about the impact of the pandemic over migration and migration policy in Japan. And uh, I think many of you probably believe that Japan is a mono-ethnic country and a somewhat exclusionary towards immigrants and refugees. And uh, this is true. Uh, so Japan's foreign born population is less than 3 million. And uh, last year, for the first time, it exceeded 2% of the population. It's for the first time. And uh, the number of naturalization per year is about 10,000. 
and of which about the half are you know, historical minority Koreans and 30% are Chinese. So you know, citizenship policy, they were restrict and uh, they are only attributed to their own blood-based principles. And, uh, and it's really difficult to not write for the, the, the newcomers. And when it comes to refugees, uh, last year, uh, only 44 people were recognized as refugees out of 10,000 applications. So the recognition or accept acceptance rate of refugee is 0.2%. It's uh, sadly, it's uh, horribly low and uh, almost like uh, 100 times lower than Germany, for instance. So as these figures show, uh, Japan's immigration policy is still quite, uh, in a sense, close and exclusionary. And uh, Japan is still a kind of closed nation compared to European countries. And however, and, uh, this situation is somewhat changing. So it has become really difficult for Japan to maintain the kind of closed society. Uh, so the, the problem itself, underlining problems are not so much different from other nations, but it's particularly acute here. So as Japan is one of the most aged country with uh, the longest life expectancy rate and a, a very secure younger generation, and a, a shortage of care workers and low skilled workers are quite serious and uh, also due to the rural the population and the changes in the industrial structure. So what is important here is that even if the overall number and the rates it, and itself are not so high and, 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 uh, and in terms of the number of uh, foreigners, uh, there is a growing dependence on foreign workers in Japan in terms of region and occupational sector, especially care and service sectors. So uh, the Japanese government uh, changed its policy uh, in October 2018, and uh, they reformed that and uh, Japan began accepting unskilled temporary foreign workers, almost like uh, almost based on the guest worker scheme. However, and, uh, for the first year, the, the, the 2019, looking at the result of the year, and it's disastrous. So Japanese government dramatically announced that they will start recruiting uh, foreign temporary workers, and uh, they tried to admit uh, 40,000 workers for the first year, and uh, 350,000 workers within five years. But, uh, but in 2019, only 3,000 have come under this visa category, and 90% uh, are actually the visa transfers from their the technical trainees. So uh, actually the result was almost disastrous. So Japanese government tried to recruit more uh, foreign temporary workers, but uh, not many has come. This is the result. Why? Uh, one thing is that, and, and actually the Japanese government uh, used this system uh, in a sense with rigidly, but uh, the more important is other countries, they are and in relation to other countries like South Korea and Taiwan and Singapore, and they are a global competition for uh, unskilled labor, and uh, not many people want to come to Japan now. And actually Japan is not so migrant friendly and no English speaking country, unfortunately. So uh, we are still in the wait and see stage, but uh, now the Japan has a trouble uh, rather in recruiting foreign temporary workers here. But the labor shortage is serious and uh, it is more and more serious under the COVID-19 pandemic. So how can we get through? And uh, currently the low skilled foreign labor in Japan is mainly provided through three main channels. The first is technical internship. And the second is Nikkeijin. And uh, Nikkeijin is uh, the second and third generations of Japanese expatriates from South America. And the third is uh, the foreign students. Let me say a bit about the three of categories. So the first is technical internship. I think you may find it something strange because it's an internship and a technical internship. So it's not their foreign worker scheme, but it is actually the de facto system of foreign labor. So this is a system began in 1993 and I fear uh, trainees are given practical training for the purpose of transferring technology and uh, developing human resources for the economic development of their home country. And uh, last year, there were uh, in total 380,000 technical interns, and uh, which is close to the number of permanent residents in Japan and uh, more than the number of skilled foreign workers. And uh, in reality, this is a, a, a technical intern but uh, in reality, uh, the technical intern systems is um, employs uh, interns as a workers, and uh, they are not engaging 
in practical training at all. And uh, their wages are quite low. And uh, there have been many reports that there are lots of human rights violations. So as I said a bit earlier, and, uh, the Japan's agriculture and uh, Japanese, uh, Japanese labors like agriculture and fishery processing and uh, constructions, and uh, they have a serious labor shortage and I wouldn't be able to survive or be sustained without technical interns. And uh, since border was closed in the spring, this spring, the shortage of workers in the field has become more and more serious. And uh, in the supermarket, the vegetable prices have surprisingly become expensive. It's not because of the due to climate change or climate, but the simply the shortage of labor. I think the situation is somewhat similar to European uh, seasonal uh, workers, but uh, this shortage of labor by technical interns uh, is very serious, but uh, they are not workers, and this is the point. So they are not officially workers, but uh, they are contributing to the Japanese society, especially in the rural area. And, uh, I will skip the uh, Asian, the Japanese this, uh, ethnic Japanese descent, and then I want to mention something about the international students. And uh, international students are students, but uh, they are also a very big source of unskilled labor. The, uh, so there are upper kismetry, the uh, 300,000 international students in Japan, and uh, most of them are from China and uh, Southeast Asia. And according to one estimate, 80% and of foreign students are actually working in Japan. And also no visas are allowed to work in convenience stores or fast food restaurants, but it, it has become very common here in Tokyo uh, to see foreigners working there. Why? Because with a student visa, uh, they can work uh, up to two, 28 hours per week. And uh, sadly, they are indeed coming to Japan as our, uh, unskilled workers to get paid. So uh, what changes would COVID-19 bring to Japanese migration policies? Well, it completely halted uh, the Japanese migration, but uh, I think you know, it's very really crucial uh, to, re uh, um, to think about you know, what we want to change the um, Japanese migration policies. So, and so, so far, Japan has accepted foreign workers as a short-term and a cheap labor force from side door, not front door. So they are uh, admitted uh, not as workers, but they are uh, admitted as a technical interns or international students or an uh, ethnic Japanese descent. But, uh, now, however, uh, with a constantly declining population and a, and a rural depopulation, it is unlikely that you know, the shortage of human resources in agriculture or fisheries or other sectors uh, will be resolved in Japan. And, and, and the effects of the new coronavirus continue to impede uh, the free movement around the world. Uh, the traditional way of accepting foreign workers here in Japan, uh, which, should be, uh, come to, which should come to an end, or I think we should um, make it an end. So this is actually a crisis uh, which uh, may, uh, may change the future of Japanese society. And uh, we need to prepare system uh, to encourage uh, the development of migrant skills and uh, include Jap Japanese language education. And uh, we should try to uh, integrate them as a member of Japanese societies. So this is a kind of the situation in Japan now but uh, now I want to add some uh, last word to the refugee admission. So as I said, the acceptance rate of 0.2% is almost the lowest in the world, I think, and uh, unbelievably small. And I would say that you know, this is true that many of applicants are from Southeast Asian countries, not from like Saudi or uh, Africa or somewhere. But, uh, um, but uh, this fact cannot explain such a lowest uh, uh, acceptance rate. So, uh, uh, so uh, I think that you know, we should, uh, Japanese government should make a more proactive stance uh, to help, uh, for instance, the European countries uh, in terms of refugee admissions as well. And uh, even if you know, we cannot you know, accept directly from you know, Saudi uh, maybe you know, it's possible to co co cooperate with European countries under the SPA or EPA schemes. So uh, I think the refugee admission or asylum seeking can be the one potential areas of Japan EU cooperation in the post pandemic era. So I finished. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Before I give the floor to Dr. Marshay, I would like to ensure everybody that you can uh, 
ask questions from uh, the panelists. If in the chat, if you use the chat function of uh, Zoom, you can send us questions directly. Uh, I will be able to ask these questions uh, in person online from the participants, but you can send them to me or to all panelists. I think that this is the default setting on um, Zoom. So, and you can uh, write these questions anytime during um, uh, the next speech as well. So, Dr. Marshall, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and I would like to also welcome uh, everybody. I uh, made a small PPT and then now try to share it with you uh, to make easier to follow my presentation. Uh, and first of all, I, I would like to underline the fact that uh, uh, although the title of the, uh, the current panel is the, uh, Migration Patterns After the Pandemic, it's very important to, to emphasize that the, the trends, uh, what we can see now in, in Europe in, in different aspects, uh, both in the member states and uh, in EU level, uh, has been already starting before the pandemic. So uh, the pandemic gave an impetus for the developments, but uh, it uh, did not change the, the, the general direction of the, the debate and, the, and uh, the discussion about migration in uh, Europe. It's uh, very important to, to emphasize that the, the circumstances is uh, very different from uh, the Japanese uh, um, example. So, uh, and first of all, we should start uh, with some basic consideration. Uh, the first issue is that, that uh, what uh, we mean under Europe. So it's the European Union plus uh, EFTA plus UK, Russia, Turkey, Western Balkan. So uh, anyhow, we should uh, see that it dozens of different countries with uh, separate uh, different uh, historical, geopolitical and cultural characteristics. So it's not easy to speak uh, about one migration policy contrary to the uh, Japanese example. In general, uh, we see three strategic trends and I will uh, check it uh, closely in this, uh, in this presentation and uh, to, to make some uh, food for thought for the round table dis discussion and for the, the, the questions. The first is demography, uh, which more or less a common feature with uh, Japan. Uh, and two other, which is uh, a little bit different. The first is the, the green pasture of Europe. I gave this title to this topic. Uh, the, and the vicinity, it's very, very, it's very important, the vicinity to these green pastures, to the MENA and the Africa region. Uh, it's very important uh, to emphasize that most people who arrive to Europe across illegal channels, illegal, uh, across illegal migration are not refugees. We have uh, very clear uh, uh, statistics about this. So uh, the most important pull factor is the, the, the living standards and the mood of Europe for these people. And the third issue will be the regional crisis, which of course has effects to European migration. So, so let's start with the demography. Well, according to the UN statistics, there is not a single European country with a fertility rate above two. Uh, so it means that actually there's not a single European country which uh, rep reproduce its uh, own uh, population. And according to the UN estimation also by uh, 2015, the European population, including Russia, will uh, shrink by 30 million even with the net immigration of more than 30 uh, million people. So in the next 30 years, almost uh, the European uh, origin population will shrink by uh, 60 million people. And it also uh, worked together with the shrinking working age population, which caused a lot of trouble for the European economy, also as we can see in uh, Japan. Uh, we see different uh, solutions for this. One is the EU internal migration, which is a very important factor, and we uh, often uh, forget it, mainly from the east and west and from the south and north. Uh, but while in some countries of Europe it, uh, it provides uh, some help for the, the, the shrinking uh, working age population, other parts of Europe, mainly from Eastern Europe, in some countries, Romania, Bulgaria, or the Baltic states, cause a lot of trouble for the, the economy and the, the maintenance of the social system. Uh, 
So what, what's, what's the, 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 the answers for this uh, demography uh, challenge? Uh, one is the, the more migration, what we can see, uh, mainly used by Western European countries, but not only. For example, if we uh, check the, the Polish example, Poland is keen to, 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 to import Ukrainian uh, labor force, mainly after the, the, the East Ukrainian uh, turmoil. Uh, first, uh, and the source of the migrants first, as we uh, saw previously from other EU countries, from the East Ukraine and from the global south, from uh, the Middle East, Africa, and partly Latin America, mainly uh, in the case of Portugal and uh, Spain. Uh, it was a general uh, use of uh, instruments to, to uh, have enough labor force in the, force in the labor market. Uh, but since 2015, uh, we could observe an increase in awareness about the, the challenges, uh, which are more and more uh, 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 evident in the case of this uh, this type of uh, answer. And we can see a huge differences uh, according to the background of the arrivals in the case of whether they manage to join the, the labor market or not. Uh, just two example, uh, in the case of Denmark, 58% uh, of the uh, refugee arrival in 2015 are unemployed and uh, the asylum seekers and who got uh, asylum uh, status in Germany between 2013 and 18, only 48% uh, of them uh, got access uh, or, or find, uh, found job in the, the labor market. So uh, it's not a solution without problems. Another answer which is uh, followed by the Hungarian government is, is uh, uh, the increasing fertility rate uh, and uh, a strong and robust uh, government intervention. Uh, into the family planning and the, the social system of the different countries uh, by tax deduction, flexible working condition loans, social benefits, uh, longer maternity leave. Uh, the, the main challenge uh, of this, what we see is that it's, it's not only about economy, not only about flexible working conditions, but also the mood and the, and the, and the behavior of the, the people. So actually it would need a new social contract between the people and the government, which is not an easy job. And uh, we should also underline that there's no uh, common EU regulation, of course, for this. And of course, we see uh, examples that uh, countries try to use both example, uh, more migration and uh, increasing uh, support for, uh, for the families like in Ireland and France. Let's go to the green pastures, the second uh, big trends. Uh, Europe and its living standards, open society, welfare system means a significant pull factor. Uh, we can summarize all of it with one word, with opportunities for the people who, who can uh, arrive to Europe, comparing with many Sub-Saharan and Middle East and North African countries. Uh, and considering the, the gaps, and not only in the, in, in the incomes, but, uh, but uh, uh, life extensity, the access to to social system, uh, we should uh, see that this central periphery antagonism will uh, maintain in the coming decades. Uh, just one example, the, the per capita GDP, annual per capita GDP uh, in the case of Hungary, which uh, of course not a, a Western European country is more than 17,000 US dollar. While uh, this uh, number in the case of Kenya, which is uh, one of the, the, the best, uh, one of the most developed countries in the Sub-Saharan Africa is just 2,000. So this is too, too big gap to, to, to bridge it within some uh, decades. And last but not least, we should uh, uh, mention the regional crises uh, around Europe, which uh, fuel instability, which fuel uh, illegal migration towards Europe, which started with the Arab Spring in 2011, which uh, led to the collapse of the, the North African so-called sanitary in the, the southern boundaries of uh, Europe. Since 2013, we uh, could have been observing an increasing turmoil in the Sahel with, with many different uh, characteristics, increasing jihadist networks, uh, climate change, overpopulation, uh, bad governance, et cetera, et cetera. We see the crisis of Ukraine and the rise of ISIS in 2000, 
14 and 15, the migration crisis. Last year, the, the third Libyan war, and this year, the Eastern Mediterranean crisis and the, and the COVID pandemic, which also contributed to, the, to these uh, issues. So in general, the picture is not so bright. Uh, uh, to sum up, there are too many problematic countries in the European neighborhood with minimal resilience and uh, capacities. Uh, just think again, as I mentioned, uh, to the Sahel region. And what we could see in 2015 with the collapse of Syria, it can easily happen in the case of uh, one of these countries, which can cause similar uh, migration and refugee influx, which happened in 2015. And it's almost impossible to, 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 to say how it will happen and when. And another problem with the differences of within uh, Europe and European Union that in spite of the, the Euro Mediterranean institution and the EU global strategy, still our instruments are in uh, insufficient and unable to defend uh, ourselves from these threats. And also, we, although we have this grand strategy, we see very different interests by uh, European countries. Uh, pursuing in these areas. So there's not a united action by uh, European countries to, to mitigate the risk uh, around our borders. There's only one common point uh, which was strengthened, the closure of the border to illegal crossing. It's, it's more or less accepted uh, by almost all European countries. It was very clear during the, the migration crisis in the, uh, in the Great Turkish border in February 2020, and uh, the strong position of the Commission and uh, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, uh, the head of the Commission. But the, the number of pending issues is numerous: the repatriation, deportation, hotspots, uh, the definition of safe third countries. So, still there is a long way uh, ahead. And some words about the Hungarian perspective. Uh, as I mentioned, there are strong attempts to, to change the demographic trends, and we could see an uh, increase between 2011 and uh, the recent years, uh, the in increase in the fertility rate, but unfortunately, the last year, this increase stopped and there is a stagnation, so, so it seems that uh, the society needs new impetus to, to increase, to, to, uh, to, to, to be ready to, to be a partner for the government for the, the increase uh, of the population. Uh, Hungary has a st strong position to, uh, to support the closure of the external border of the EU to illegal crossing. You know, Hungary was the, the first country which sanctions the border by fences in 2015 uh, to stop the, the, the flood of um, uh, illegal migrants. There is a strong government position to reject the distribution of asylum, asylum seekers, but the government is ready to to, to provide uh, other assistance uh, to, to, to demonstrate solidarity to the, the front states for, final, for example, financial assistance, participation in peacekeeping operation, or the, the stipendium Hungary programs. Uh, we should underline that if we put together the numbers, it's a huge amount of, of numbers. So it's, uh, it's uh, at least hundreds of millions of euro, which uh, by which Hungary contributed to the, the, the common actions and defense of uh, the European borders. Uh, there's an, uh, another strategic direction that the, is the, the local assistance. It's in uh, crisis stricken situations. One of the main implementation for this is the Hungary Health Program, launching in crisis zones from the, the Middle East to, to Sub-Saharan Sub Africa. And it's also an important uh, issue to, uh, to have a better understanding of local uh, dynamics. Uh, and in this field, we can see an increasing scientific research activity, uh, the, the increase of the diplomatic missions uh, all around uh, the European uh, problematic borders. So, so these are the main uh, steps across which Hungary tries to understand and, and mitigate uh, the, the challenges of illegal migration patterns. So uh, I stop now, sorry, that it was a little bit long. So I, I now uh, I, I give back the the, the words to Marty. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for both of the very interesting presentations. They were really good food for thought. Uh, we already received a question, but before we go to these questions from the attendees, let me ask you both two questions in general, 
and uh, I would like to ask you to answer them shortly. Sh uh, shortly. The first is, um, without undermining the raison d'etre of this very discussion, I would like to ask you whether you think that currently this time is, is, is this a good time to make long-term pro projections regarding the future and the migration patterns? Uh, how can you cope with this uncertainty regarding COVID-19? You mentioned many changes taking place in the migration policies of different countries. Nevertheless, can we, how can we decide as observers whether these changes are short-term or long-term? That would be my first question. The second question is that in the European discussion, uh, the ideal rate of, of migration is usually framed as a trade-off uh, between economic security and demographic sustainability on the one hand and the protection of the national culture on the other. First of all, do you agree with this trade the existence of this trade-off in strategic decision-making? And if so, how did COVID-19 change the balance of um, these values, these aims in this trade-off? Who would like to answer first? Okay, so I will. So thank you for the really great questions. And uh, to answer to your question shortly, and I think the impact of COVID-19 should be the long term. But uh, at least, you know, for now, actually we are halting all the migration now. So uh, it might be a really good time to think about the future uh, migration policies. And uh, they are, you know, we are you know, already starting about, you know, how to uh, start admitting migrants, you know, from our other countries and uh, how to you know, reduce the gap in their labor and their prison and so on. So it's a really good time you know, among Japanese to uh, discuss about the future migration policy. And then uh, to, and for the second question, yes, you know, I think there are you know, huge um, tensions between the cultural homogeneity and also the democratic balance or economic security. And uh, it is particularly acute in Japan. And uh, so uh, and, uh, and I am, and, so for my personal perspective, I'm quite liberal and uh, I think, you know, we should open our borders, you know, or, or, or I th I'm an advocate of fair migration policies. But at the same time, I understand that there are a reluctance for Japanese people to open up their societies. And uh, of course, you know, we should think about how we can adjust the cultural changes for Japanese population. And otherwise, you know, there will be the kind of revival of populism will uh, spread uh, in Japan. So you know, I think, you know, it should be a long-term effect and the COVID-19 should have a long-term effect on Japanese migration policies. But uh, this long-term or slow uh, policy changes may have a time for Japanese society to adjust uh, to migration patterns. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Marshay. Well, to tell you the truth, I'm, I belong to the group who is a little bit skeptical about the, the long-term effects of uh, COVID-19, mainly in the case of migration. Because what happened in the last six months uh, and what we could see is actually demonstrated that uh, our instruments, the, the instruments as European countries to, to, to stop migration is uh, uh, sometimes limited, you know. So actually March and uh, April when we saw the, the absolute reduction of number of illegal crossing in the Mediterranean, actually it was not because of the decision of the European countries or the the strengthening of, I don't know, Irini operation, or et cetera, et cetera. It was clearly the decision of the illegal migrant who, 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 who didn't want to cross to, to Italy, which has a very, very bad reputation, okay? And after two months, when it uh, became evident that uh, uh, COVID-19 is not such a lateral thing, let's say, than Ebola, or at least the, in the understanding of illegal migrants, is not so so devastating like Ebola. Uh, the number also increased, and, and by uh, by now we could see that uh, uh, we, we could see an increase of 150 percent, for example, in the arrival of Italy, comparing uh, with the previous year this period between January and September. So uh, this is an, an important issue. And it's also an important, important issue that in the region around Europe, uh, which is the main uh, countries of origin for, and I emphasize again for irregular and illegal migrants, the, the perspective towards COVID is very, very different than the perspective of uh, the Europeans, you know, because uh, the, the connection towards, uh, it, it's, 
uh, burdened by con strong conspiracy, cons a conspiracy theory. There is uh, a very strong fatalistic approach towards the, the pandemic. If we are reading the news about, I don't know, Somalia, Egypt, uh, Mali, uh, most people consider that their life is in the, in the hand of God. Uh, so it's not about the protection, not about social distances, but, but the decision of God. And uh, if we also consider that uh, different diseases in mainly Sub-Saharan Africa, like malaria or sometimes smallpox or, or other, other uh, diseases still there and, and uh, killing the population, uh, a new, new COVID pandemic uh, seems for them it's not so devastating. And, uh, and the last consideration for this is that uh, uh, everybody thought that it will cause a dramatic collapse in, in, uh, in Africa for the social system, for the economy. Until now, and we are in the COVID since half a year, we, we haven't seen this dramatic collapse in Africa. So the perspective of local people is that, yeah, COVID is here, perhaps it will kill me or my father or, 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 or I don't know, my, my grandparents. But in general, it, it doesn't change the mind of the people who decide to, to travel to, to Europe or the Middle East or from the Middle East to, I don't know, Asia or, or, or Europe. What changed or got more impetus is the, the closure of the border of the, the European Union. So, so but, but as I mentioned, the process has started uh, earlier. So, uh, so it's evident that uh, countries, European countries, U European people uh, want to know who arrived to, to Europe, whether he's infected by COVID or not. But uh, you know our our uh, wishes and expectations uh, don't matter really in this case. Um, so so this is about the first, first question. The, the second question is yeah, yeah it's, it's hard to say anything. It's a it's an antagonist debate, uh, and because different European countries uh, turn to this question with different answers and different historical background, uh, I, I don't see an easy solution in this, in this issue, mainly because you know, a, a multi-ethnic society is a fact in some European countries, and uh, the living together with, for example, radical Islam uh, in some part of Europe, in some part of some European cities is still a fact. Why, for example, in Central Eastern Europe, it's, it's, uh, we have still the chance to, to stop this, uh, this process. So, so we have different problems within the European Union. So the, the, the strategic uh, considerations will be also different, I'm afraid. And uh, Dr. Marche, do you see any changes in the calculation of national governments in uh, Europe regarding this trade off due to COVID-19? To tell you the truth, not really. I, 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 I don't see it. Uh, I think what changed per, perhaps the, the, the discussion in some countries, but uh, these are very, very uh, narrow changes, for example, and uh, it doesn't affect the, the, the basic direction of the discussion. J just one example, for example, Italy. Uh, Italy in general, was, and the Italian societies was more or less open for, uh, for the arrival by the, the, the 2010s years. And after uh, 2010, uh, sorry, and after 2010, we see uh, increasing resistance toward the, towards the illegal arrivals. And uh, uh, we could see the political procedures, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And now, after the, the season of the arrival for the, the, the seasonal workers, there is also a, a little bit softening approach towards this. But, uh, but in general, what we see, even from the Conte government, is a, is a more, more cautious uh, approach towards the arrival of illegal migrants, mainly uh, across the Mediterranean Sea. Thank you very much. Uh, there was a question to Professor Miyai. Tomorrow we will have a new prime minister in Japan, Suga Yoshihide, who is said to be one of the, uh, the most pro-migration politicians 
Can Suga as Prime Minister give boost to opening up Japan more to foreign labor or will the COVID-19 pandemic stay a stronger force keeping Japan closed for a longer time? Generally, do you expect change in the migration policy of the government? Okay, thank you. It's a really big question and a great question. And it's a question from Gabor san Yeah, thank you. So first of all, the, my short answer to this question is that I don't expect that um, big changes in Japan's migration policies. Uh, so uh, actually, uh, as you said, the uh, uh, Suga is considered as uh, one of the most pro you know, migrant uh, politicians, but at the same time, he's the closest ally of Abe, uh, Shinzo Abe. So uh, Shinzo Abe is quite reluctant to introduce migrants on a long-term basis. So I think you know, we can expect that you know, they will pursue the way to uh, broaden the guest worker scheme or guest worker style admissions. But uh, at the same time, as I explained in my presentation, and this had kind of you know, guest worker scheme hasn't worked well, and uh, they cannot you know, reach the uh, number of uh, target uh, admittance of the new visa scheme. So you know, we need a kind of radical uh, reform of you know, guest worker scheme as well. And then maybe we should uh, permit the long-term residence of guest workers as well. So in this sense, you know, Suga is in some sense quite liberal and when he talked to the newspaper. So in that sense, we may um, expect the kind of slight changes in migration policy, but I don't expect the kind of huge radical changes in migration policy, and, uh, at least you know, in the short run. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to remind everybody that um, you have the possibility to ask questions from Dr. Miai or Dr. Marsha using the chat function of Zoom or the Q&A function of Zoom. I will see both sources and I will be able to ask the questions. Uh, meanwhile, let me ask Dr. Marsha regarding the migration and asylum pact of the uh, European uh, Union's Commission. We have been waiting for this uh, for a very long time. It is now, as I, as I saw it just in, in a second ago, it is set to be re revealed next week. What can we expect of that? Yes, but it wasn't fixed that week next week. Yeah. Sorry, no, no, you know, because uh, since July, there is always a declaration that the, the pact will come in the ne next week, so then at least next month. Uh, well, uh, the general direction, as I mentioned, is more or less clear that for illegal migration, there will be uh, a more more tough uh, approach. But the, the problem is that uh, there are so many debated issues between the, the member states and of course, within the commission and between the commission and the member states, that uh, it's very hard to see which, which could be a uh, silver bullet uh, between these, 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 uh, these very, very different approaches, which uh, stem from the, the geopolitical differences. So how we can, how we can make a common platform for, uh, for an Italian, or a Greece approach, uh, or a Greek sorry, approach to a, a, a Balkanian approach. Uh, what we can do the the, the distribution of asylum seekers, which is a, a must for Italy or, or, or Greece, but is strongly rejected, for example, Hungary and other Central European uh, countries. So. Uh, what the, the, the what the, the protection of the EU external borders means exactly? Uh, so there are too many uh, pending issues, uh, and uh, it's not accidental that the, the Commission tried to the, try to come out with this this package under the, the German presidency to have the the support of the perhaps the strongest nation of the the European Union. But uh, in the Council, we see that uh, there will be strong debates, and uh, of course, the, the, the delay of the, 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 uh, the coming out uh, with the package is also likely because of the resistance of, of the, 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 the member states. So, uh, in some aspects, uh, we are still uh, in uh, 2015 or let's say 16 and 17, that we have seen some 
directions, some possible solutions, but there's no real common common platform or common common uh, approach to, towards these issues. For example, the, the the repatriation of the people, the definition of uh, of uh, safe third countries, which which is a very very hot debate, not mainly between the member states, but uh, between the member states and the uh, the European uh, court. So yeah, I'm a little bit skeptical. I'm a little bit skeptical that we'll see a big breakthrough even if the package will come out. Thank you very much. Meanwhile, we received another question um, to Dr. Miai. Is Japan's migration trajectory a modified version of the Singapore model? That means relatively strict restrictions on permanent residency for non-skilled, low-skilled, and flexibility for highly skilled. Uh, thank you for a good question. So, Donna, if the Singapore model means that, you know, as you uh, defined, and, and actually the Japanese migration trajectory is uh, the, a modified version of Singapore model, but at the same time, the Singapore is much more harsher uh, system, like, you know, deporting the uh, migrant care workers if they, are, they got pregnant for instance. So this kind of you know, uh, rules uh, cannot be uh, tolerated in Japan, to, uh, at least officially. So I think you know, it's better to think about kind of South Korea can be a better model for Japanese migration policies, uh, because actually the South Korea had a kind of really similar model to Japanese migration policy, and uh, sometimes they modeled uh, Japanese immigration policy. But uh, from 2000, you know, they reformed the system uh, very much. And uh, the basic principle is the same. So uh, it uh, for, uh, put the strict restrictions on the permanent residency and a flexible uh, admission for their skilled labor. But at the same time, their human rights protection, the level of human rights protection is much better than other uh, East Asian countries. So I think you know Japan can be posited the kind of uh, uh, at the middle of South Korea and, uh, and uh, Singapore. So uh, and, and I hope, you know, Japan um, to move to a more uh, South Korean side or uh, respecting more human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a couple of minutes left. So I urge everybody, if uh, you have any questions to pose it now in the chat function or the Q&A function, Meanwhile, let me ask another general question for the both of you. Um, it has been observed and it has been mentioned many times during the past couple of months that refugee communities are among the most uh, are among those who are most exposed to the COVID-19 situation and the bad effects. Do you see any changes in the behavior of the international community in general regarding cooperation? Um, in, in, in terms of refugee issues, can we expect any kind of global cooperation in this regard? Or what do you think, what would Japan or the EU want to see in this situation? If you don't mind, then I will start. Uh, I think uh, we don't see uh, a big cooperation uh, in this aspect. Uh, to the contrary, we see uh, the decline of, uh, of assistance for the, the refugee communities. So actually there is a deteriorating situation in, in many places. For example, in East Africa, just in the last week or two weeks ago was uh, uh, a statement by the, uh, the UNHCR that they had to reduce the, the daily portion of food for the people by, by 20% because of the, the lack of funds. So, so actually the most vulnerable communities uh, of the world are highly, highly uh, affected by the, the, the COVID crisis, and not mainly because of the infections, but because of the, the, the declining funds. But the other, other side of the coin is that in some humanitarian crises, the international community acted very fast and uh, efficiently, uh, efficiently to, to, to stop. Uh, uh, one example for this is the, the, the action against the uh, the the invasion of uh, oh, sorry the uh, the, the, the words don't came to my mind uh, the shash uh, the you know the the attacks of of the insects in East Africa 
you know, so uh, which endangers 10 million people, the, the food security of 10 million people. So actually the, uh, the World Food Program and the, and the FAO acted very fast. The donor, donor community uh, gave the money, so they managed to, to, to save the harvest from the, from the insects. Thank well, you. Oh, thank you. So, well, this is a really difficult question. And, and, and of course, you know, I hope that there will be a global cooperation for refugees. But at the same time, now that, you know, the US and China, and there is a kind of global competition for the hegemonies. So I think it's really difficult to uh, boost the kind of global cooperation on this, uh, under this strategic uh, footprint. But at the same time, I, I hope that, you know, Japan and the EU at, at least, you know, has a really in a good conditions. And uh, we can discuss about the kind of potential cooperation on the refugee issues and um, because we have the already the economic partnership agreement and also the strategic partnership agreement. So you know, I think you know this can be the basis for the liberal global uh, cooperation and I hope that you know, Japan will be the kind of partner of the EU to pursue this path. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any questions coming from the audience. So I would like to thank uh, Dr. Miyai Takeshi and Dr. Marsh, uh, Victor Marshay for attending um, this very interesting um, uh, seminar and share their ideas regarding migration patterns in Japan and the EU after or during the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Thanks everybody for coming to this online discussion and uh, thanks for the uh, Institute of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Japan Institute of International Affairs for this cooperation. Uh, please join us at our f next events. Uh, let that be on Zoom, on Facebook, uh, and check out our social media as well on Facebook, on Instagram, and also on Twitter. Thank you very much. Thank you.